you, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the University of Sussex. And the last talk this year, this academic year, the last talk in our Institute of Physics um, series for this year. We've had some wonderful talks, so I'm really pleased um, this year. And um, there's going to be no exception, I'm sure, tonight. But on to tonight. So tonight, we have um, a good friend of mine, Kifrina Jackman, and we were both at the University of Leicester together many, many years ago. Not that many. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Another year, well, maybe 10 years, only a decade ago. It, some time ago we were at Leicester, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why Katrina did her, her PhD. Katrina is a planetary scientist. She did postdocs at um, Imperial at the University College London. And she now is um, a planetary scientist at the University of Southampton. And um, I'm very pleased to see you here, and um, thank you for coming to talk. So, no without any further ado, Dr. Katrina Jackman, thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> I'm going to try and turn these down. If you get too sleepy, just kind of wave your arms and I can turn the lights up. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yeah, had some microphone attaching issues, as some of you saw. Um, yes, so as, as um, Daz alluded to, I began my planetary science career at the University of Leicester. Uh, I arrived there in 2003, just when Cassini was about to get to Saturn, and so I completely lucked out, had my PhD studying uh, data from Cassini's approach to Saturn and from the initial Saturn orbit insertion manoeuvre. And then I've kind of haven't looked back really. So I've basically spent the last 10 to 12 years, most of my waking moments, thinking about Saturn. Uh, more recently, I worked a little bit on Jupiter and Mercury, but Saturn is still kind of my, my first love and arguably uh, the best planet in the solar system. So what I'm going to do tonight is take you on a real whistle-stop tour of some of the highlights of the Cassini mission, which has now <coughs> celebrated more than 10 years at Saturn. Um, but I'll start off longer than 10 years ago. So I'll start off by just introducing Saturn as, a, as an object to observe in the night sky. So can you just put your hands up if you've actually observed Saturn through a telescope ever? OK, more than half, so that's good. Uh, Saturn is a beautiful planet, and the rings make it a fantastic object to observe because, of course, it changes over time as the angle of the rings changes relative to us. And this posed a few difficulties, or challenges, I should say, for some of the initial observers. So one of the first people to spend a decent amount of time thinking about Saturn was Galileo. So here he is up here. And when he initially looked in 1610 at Saturn, he was a bit confused because he saw this object at the centre. And then he saw what he thought were these two smaller, maybe little stars either side. Then when he looked six years later, so Saturn's seasons had moved on, he saw the same objects in the centre, but then he saw what he described as these two half ellipses with these dark triangles either side. Now, of course, we know that what he was looking at was he was looking at the rings side on, but he wasn't totally sure at the time about the geometry of what he was viewing. So move on a couple of years to a Dutch astronomer called Christian Huygens, after whom the Huygens probe has, was named. Uh, Christian Huygens looked again at Saturn. He had a slightly better telescope than Galileo did. And what he actually realized was that these arms were a so well, what he thought uh, represented a solid ring around, around the planet. Um, he also discovered Titan, uh, which is the moon that the Huygens probe has subsequently landed on. And then moving on just a little bit further, we've got Cassini, who was a French-Italian astronomer who also uh, wanted to solve this puzzle of the rings. And so he advanced on this solid ring idea, and he actually realized that the rings were made of lots of tiny particles. And he actually discovered this gap in the rings, which we now call the Cassini division. And in his spare time, he also discovered four moons. So he was uh, pretty prolific in terms of his Saturn work. But of course, observing from the ground is fantastic, but if you have the opportunity to go somewhere, it's even better. But there are a couple of challenges to observing the solar system. The first is that you'll notice that the sun is here, and where we call home this small rocky planet is on one side of this asteroid belt, and Jupiter and Saturn and so on are on the other side of the asteroid belt. And so 
When people were initially thinking about sending spacecraft to Saturn, they were a little bit worried about trying to cross this asteroid belt, and they knew that there were lots of rocks of many different sizes, and they were worried that any spacecraft that flew through there was going to get sort of smashed to bits. In the end, that hasn't turned out to be the case, because the asteroid belt is somewhat more diffuse than maybe people originally thought. But that was certainly the first barrier to people thinking about exploring beyond the terrestrial planets. But the second barrier, which might sound really obvious, is that space is quite big. And so it's actually just not feasible to launch a spacecraft directly from the Earth and get it all the way into the outer solar system with just the amount of fuel that you can load onto it, because it's just too heavy. And so people thought about this problem, and actually one particular person thought about this problem, and that was somebody called Gary Flandro. Anyone, hands up, anyone heard of Gary Flandro? A couple of people. So Gary was a summer student um, at Caltech in 1965, and he obviously was showing some promise, and his supervisor thought that he'd give him a job that would keep him quiet for a couple of months. And so he said, OK, Gary, why don't you try and have a look at a trajectory that's going to get a spacecraft from the Earth out into the outer solar system, passing as many planets as you can along the way. And what he found was that actually there was a serendipitous alignment of all of the planets in the late 70s and early 80s, such that you could launch a spacecraft from the Earth and pass by every single planet on the way. So you could pass by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, and that's precisely what the Voyager spacecraft have done. So they've taken advantage of passing by these planets to use them as a gravity assist. So it's kind of like if you're on a train and you pass through multiple stations, instead of slowing down and stopping at each station, i.e. every time you pass by a planet, you actually speed up. And the reason why you speed up is that the mass of the planets gives you this gravity boost, and particularly massive planets like Jupiter give you a massive, massive gravity boost to get out to the outer reaches of the solar system. So you have to navigate the asteroid belt, and then you have to devise a trajectory that's going to get you there with a, a sensible amount of fuel. And then once you can do that, then uh, we've had missions like these. So these were the first missions that flew by Saturn. So Pioneer 11 in 1979, uh, uh, image shown here on the left, and then the Voyagers in 1980 and 1981. And of course, the Voyagers are now the furthest man-made objects in the solar system. And so Pioneer took the first close-up pictures of Saturn, so much better than you're going to get through a telescope from the Earth. Um, and crit critically, actually, Pioneer charted Saturn's magnetic field for the first time, <coughs> and that's what I specialize in studying. Uh, the Voyagers, of course, took more images and also sampled the magnetic field again, but they also did things like look at the composition of the atmosphere. So we're always trying to understand how the solar system formed, how it came to be that you have these rocky planets close to the sun and these gas giants further out. And so Voyager sort of helped to gather another piece of that puzzle in terms of looking at the composition of Saturn's atmosphere. It also measured winds at the equator, and it also measured the rotation rate of the planet, or so they thought. We'll come back to that, we'll come back to that a little bit later. But immediately after Voyager had left, people thought, that's so fantastic, we've had this glimpse of Saturn, but we actually really want to go and we, find, we want to find out more. And so we really want to have a dedicated orbiter, not just a flyby. We want to go to Saturn and spend many, many years studying it. <clears throat> and so in 1982, the Cassini mission had its sort of formal beginning. And, that, and I was born in 1982, so just to give you kind of a sense, you can see how many wrinkles I have at this point, of how long it takes from something being initially thought of to actually coming to fruition. So if you're in the planetary science game, it's a long game from initially having the idea to send a spacecraft, getting a funding agency to agree, building instruments, getting teams together, launching, and actually getting there. So it started in 1982. All those processes were, were gone through. It's a joint NASA, European Space Agency, and Italian Space Agency mission, with NASA providing the Cassini orbiter, European Space Agency provi primarily providing the Huygens probe, and the Italians providing the high gain antenna, which is here at the top. Uh, the size of the spacecraft is about the size of a double decker bus, and this is a kind of standard NASA employee, probably slightly taller than me, just to give you a sense of scale. 
Uh, and then Cassini was launched in October of 1997, and then it took this gravity assist route. So it went past, um, swung by the Earth, it swung by Venus twice, it swung by Jupiter in what they call the Millennium flyby, and then it finally got to Saturn in July of 2004, when I was just getting to the end of my first year of my PhD. Uh, and I think I didn't really appreciate at the time just how much effort had gone in to planning it because the data just came and I just worked on them and I mean it was great but it's only now as I've kind of progressed in my career through planetary science that I've learned how much effort it takes to actually get a, a mission from the beginnings to actually being reality. So arrival in uh, July of 2004 and then there have been many science objectives that have been set out by the project and I'm going to just focus on some of the key ones here so not in any particular order first I'm going to talk about the icy satellite Saturn has 60 plus moons of all shapes and sizes uh, I'll talk about them first uh, Titan of course is a primary uh, goal of the mission not least because it's scientifically interesting and because the Huygens probe was going to land on it but also because Titan is quite a big moon and so it can be used as a gravity assist for Cassini, so we can kind of do some little trajectory tweaks rather cheaply by using Titan's gravity. Uh, I'm going to talk about the magnetosphere, which is my particular area of research, and then very briefly about the planet and the rings. So first up, the icy satellites. As I say, there are more than 60 of them. This is sort of a rogues gallery of uh, some of my favorites. They have all sorts of crazy names. <coughs> the first one that Cassini ran into, well not ran into, passed, passed by in a controlled manner, um, was Phoebe. This is recorded, isn't it? Oh dear. Uh, was Phoebe. Okay, it passed by Phoebe on its way in. Phoebe is literally an oddball. Uh, Phoebe orbits retrograde. It's unlike any of the other icy moons of Saturn. And so it's actually thought that Phoebe is a captured object, so that it didn't necessarily form at the same time as Saturn. It wasn't formed from any of the ring particles or anything, but rather it might have actually been captured from the Kuiper belt, which is a region much, much further out in the solar system. Uh, what other ones are odd? Well, you've got the Death Star moon, which is Mimas. You've got Iapetus, which is the yin-yang or two-tone moon. So it's black as coal on one side, white as snow on the other side. We're still not totally sure why. We're not sure whether, as it orbits around, the black side is sort of gathering some kind of soot onto itself, or whether there's material oozing out. Um, but yes, so a whole range of, of behaviors and, and topologies of moons. But arguably, uh, the most exciting icy moon is Enceladus. And here is Enceladus in its full glory. It's an icy moon of Saturn that was discovered by William Herschel in 1789. And it has the highest albedo of any body in the solar system. And that just means that it reflects a lot of sunlight. It's really, really bright. And the surface is dominated by fresh, clean ice. And I'm really putting emphasis on the word fresh here. Because when something is fresh in the solar system, that immediately starts you to think, actually, what does that mean? Is it young? Is there something that's renewing the surface? Because most inert bodies in the solar system, like our own moon, for example, are old and their surfaces are really cratered. And you wouldn't describe the surface of the moon, our own moon, as fresh. But Enceladus definitely is fresh. And just, I'll show you from this image, you can see straight away quite distinct different uh, regions, different morphologies. You can see this cratered region in the northern hemisphere and these stripes, which we'd call the tiger stripes in the southern hemisphere, and we'll learn a bit more about them in a second. So initially, you know, the Cassini um, trajectory design is quite complicated, and it takes Cassini gently past most of the moons at some point. And so orbit insertion was July 2004, and then early in 2005 was the first and then the second flyby of Enceladus. Now, initially, when Cassini went past and told us, we didn't expect to see anything particularly exciting. Apologies in advance if there are any geologists in the room that are really, really very fired up about rocks. Um, but I'm a plasma person. Rocks are lovely, but they're not that exciting from a plasma and magnetic field perspective. So if Enceladus was just a standard 
rocky, inert moon. If you fly past it with a spacecraft that has a magnetometer, so an um, instrument that's going to measure the magnetic field, you're not really going to sense anything. You're just going to fly past it and you're just going to be measuring Saturn's <laughs> magnetic field as normal, undisturbed. But that isn't what we saw. So Cassini flew by in February and then again in March of 2005. And here is Enceladus. And what the, the magnetometer, the magnetic field measurement actually, magnetic field instrument measured was a deflection in the flow. So it was measuring Saturn's magnetic field, which is illustrated here by these sort of dipole shape butterfly wing field lines. And as it passed by, it saw some disturbance in these field lines. And that was really, really unexpected, as I say, because if Enceladus was just some inert moon, you wouldn't expect to see any change. So this was really too good an opportunity to miss. And so the principal investigator of the magnetometer went to NASA and said, look, we're, we've gone all the way to Saturn. We've seen this really weird signature. We want to go a little bit closer. And so she actually managed to persuade the mission planners to tweak the trajectory and take the spacecraft a bit closer than planned. So the third flyby, which was in July of 2005, was actually at an altitude of 173 kilometers, so relatively close to the surface of Enceladus. And then we really started to nail down what the issue was. And what we actually found was a very localized signature, and specifically outgassing via a plume that was coming from the southern pole. And when we combine those plasma and magnetic field measurements with temperature maps, we see that the predicted temperature is fairly uh, uniform, relatively uniform, whereas the observed temperature shows a real hot spot at the southern pole. And we know that the higher temperature, the less strongly bound the atmosphere is to the body. And so that tells us that somehow from the southern pole of Enceladus, material is being, is being allowed to escape. And we can kind of zoom in a bit more on that geology by looking, uh, by looking at this. So these are these tiger stripes. These are these fractures along the southern pole. And we can get closer and closer and closer to them. Again, we notice that these, this tiger stripe region is very different to this cratered region in the northern hemisphere. But there are very, very extensive cracks or fractures along the surface of Enceladus. And they range in size from just a couple of hundred meters to a couple of um, kilometers. And over time, so I told you about the first three flybys. But since then, we've had many, many more flybys of Enceladus because it's such a, such a puzzle to us. And what we've actually been able to do is map along these fractures, map all the way along these tiger stripes, and look at their temperature. And so what I'm showing you here is actually an infrared heat map of these tiger stripes. And what you can see are the yellow stars are these, the locations of these jets, the locations of where this material is, is coming off the surface. And they're really, really hot. It's all relative. They're minus 93 degrees C compared to the surface, which is minus 201. But locally, they are, they're, they're really, really hot compared to the, the rest of Enceladus. And so what we know now is that along these tiger stripes, you have actual water vapor coming off the surface. And we know that because we've been able to fly the spacecraft right through these plumes and essentially sniff the chemistry of what's coming off and take these kind of mass spectrograms and find out the material that's contained inside these plumes. And so we see a lot of water vapor, but critically, we also see ammonia. And ammonia is important because ammonia acts as an antifreeze and that helps to keep any of the water in this liquid form. And so we're at the point now where we can do things like we can, can actually constrain the amount of material that comes off the surface. We know that it's about 100 kilograms a second. And we can track where the material goes when it comes off Enceladus. And so what we know now is that here's Enceladus <laughs> at the center of the image, is that material forms a brand new ring, a ring that we never knew about before, a ring which is called the E-ring which completely encircles Saturn, and that 100 kilograms a second diffuses out from Enceladus, and Enceladus, of course, is, is orbiting around Saturn, and it forms this beautiful, quite diffuse ring. We also know that the fissures expand and contract as Enceladus orbits around, so at different points in its orbit, it's slightly closer to or slightly further away from Saturn. When it's closer to Saturn, it, it's sensing Saturn's gravity more strongly, and so the fissures are kind of squeezed shut, 
when it's further away from Saturn, they're able to expand and relax a bit more. And as they expand, more material comes out. So Enceladus certainly has been one of the real treats of the Cassini mission. It's really an illustration of how you can devise a plan and say, we want to go and observe this planet and we're going to find out X, Y, and Z. And then within six months of getting there, you stumble across something that takes you in a totally new direction. And certainly for any future exploration of Saturn, the study of Enceladus is going to be absolutely central. And that will be uh, kind of constraining how we devise a spacecraft that's going to go there in the future. Okay, so that was a very brief tour of the icy satellites. So next, I want to talk about Titan. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. As I said earlier, it's interesting scientifically, but it's also really handy because of its size. We can use it to do some trajectory correction as we orbit around Saturn. Its solid surface is larger than Mercury, and it was discovered by Huygens, that Dutch astronomer. I showed you his picture earlier. Uh, it's about 50% water ices, but other kind of um, organic compounds, and 50% rock. Um, but critically, it's the only moon in the solar system to possess a significant atmosphere. And that's interesting for many reasons, but not least because it's thought to be similar to how the early Earth was. And as I said earlier, we're always trying to understand how did the solar system form? What were conditions like in the past? And how have conditions evolved to how they are now? And so we can study Titan and in some ways learn perhaps about the early Earth by looking at Titan. Uh, now, when I say looking at Titan, it's a bit of a challenge when you're looking from above because essentially you just see this sulfurous, cloudy haze. It's sort of shrouded in, in orange. Here I'm showing you it in black and white, but it's very, very difficult to see just visually through to the surface without sophisticated radar instruments. But one thing that we can do if you're into clouds um, is track the clouds. And actually, as if people weren't obsessed enough with the weather you know, in England, now you can be obsessed about the weather on Titan. Because over the years, we've passed by Titan so many times, more than 100. And over all that time, we've tracked the season. So we've watched clouds passing by. I'm going to show you a movie of the lakes in a second, but we've actually managed to um, observe rain and monsoons on Titan and lakes emptying and lakes filling and it raining and it raining for ages and then it not raining for a while. And so, you know, if you like geology, Saturn and its moons are great. If you like rain and clouds, Saturn also has something for you. So there is sort of something for everyone. But certainly uh, looking at the cloud tops is great. But again, we had the opportunity to go one better. And this was really the aim uh, of the Huygens probe. So I showed you the image of the Cassini spacecraft earlier uh, when it was just in, in the vibration testing facility with the Huygens probe, which is shaped a little bit like a barbecue strapped to the side. Huygens was released on Christmas Day of 2004 because obviously scientists have nothing better to do on Christmas Day than go into the office. Uh, so it was released on Christmas Day, and then on the 14th of January 2005, it actually landed on the surface of Titan. But here's an image that it took during its descent. So this is from an altitude of 16 kilometers above the surface of Titan. And it's not uh, kind of too far of a stretch to say that it's almost an Earth-like landscape. It's not to totally alien. We see what looks a little bit like a beach we see what looks a little bit like some kind of a river channel, some kind of dendritic pattern. But on the way down as well, uh, Huygens was able to measure things like the clouds, things like the atmosphere, uh, the structure of the atmosphere, how quickly the winds were, were traveling, what the temperatures were, so that it was able to get a vertical profile of, of Titan's atmosphere. And then ultimately the probe hit the surface at a controlled speed of about 4.5 meters a second. And then this was the picture that people had spent 25 years of their career looking forward to. So uh, some enhanced color on the left and then just a black and white <laughs> image with some annotations here on the right. And so uh, Huygens landed in the northern hemisphere of Titan and it landed in what could be described as a sort of a slightly moist river valley. Uh, initially when the French principal investigator of Huygens was asked what the surface was like. He described it as creme brulee texture. 
uh, which is sort of slightly crunchy on the top and then slightly softer inside. But really, he just meant wet sand, but I think creme brulee was kind of a bit more media friendly. Um, so landed on the surface, and the surface was darker than had been originally expected. And it consisted of a mixture of water ices and hydrocarbon ices, things like methane and ethane. But again, for the geologists in the room, if you look, for example, at uh, if you look at this particular rock, you'll notice how it's actually quite rounded underneath. How do rocks get rounded underneath? Well, they get rounded by fluvial activity. They get rounded by erosion from flowing liquid of some kind. And so that was really interesting because that means that liquid has flowed or is flowing on the surface of Titan at some point. So this was just sort of just taking you through the, the, the kind of timeline of how we learn about Titan, looking at it from above, then trying to peer down through the haze, then actually landing on the surface. But subsequently, we've had more than 100 flybys, and we've now been able to see a real treat for the Northern Hemisphere. So I'm just going to, oopsie daisies. I'm going to show you, I hope, a short movie with some of the highlights. There is music. The music is not really that important. Um, that's probably just muted me. Oh, no, there it is. Never mind. Enjoy the music. <laughs> So that sort of just summarizes where, where we're at in terms of our understanding of Titan now that we've been able to, is this still on? Yeah, sure. Um, that we can uh, observe these hydrocarbon lakes in the Northern Hemisphere, which contain about 90%, 97% of all of the liquid that we found so far on Titan. And again, that's a challenge for the geologists to try and understand how, uh, what geological processes would have caused such deep depressions in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly to allow for these enormous lakes and seas. And since then, they've done amazing things, like they've actually observed waves on the surface of one of these lakes because they can peer down through the clouds with these radars and they can see slight changes in the reflectivity of the surface. And they've also been able to estimate the depth of one of the lakes, which is about 170 meters deep. And it is just amazing to me to think that we can build a spacecraft, fly it for seven years, land it on a moon on another planet, and then know this kind of detail. It's, anyway, I think it's great. Um, okay, best thing ever about Saturn, in my hugely biased opinion, is Saturn's magnetosphere. So what is a magnetosphere? Well, a magnetosphere is a magnetic bubble that forms around a magnetized planet. We are all currently sitting within Earth's magnetosphere. It's the reason why we're all alive and we're not completely fried by radiation from the sun. So Saturn, like the Earth, like Jupiter, like Mercury, is a planet that has a strong internal magnetic field. So any of you who will have done an experiment in school where you threw iron filings at a magnet will see that magnetic field lines trace this kind of dipole shape, this sort of butterfly-like wing shape around the magnet from northern to southern poles. Earth acts like a giant magnet, so does Saturn. So you've got this giant magnet in space with these invisible magnetic field lines stretching out into space. That is then embedded in a flow of plasma, a flow of charged particles from the sun called the solar winds. So these are various images taken of the sun. Here's one where it's taken an eclipse, which 
actually is kind of topical for the moment. Don't look directly at the sun on the 20th, anybody. Uh, you know, advice from your outreach officer over here. Um, but we can actually trace the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. This is, uh, these are images taken, I don't know how to use the laser pointer. Uh, these are images taken where you can actually see the plasma, the charged particles that are coming off the surface of the sun, tracking along these magnetic field lines. And so you've got this magnetized flow of plasma that's coming off the sun, and then it's encountering the obstacle of a magnetized planet, and that's how a magnetosphere forms. But we can actually trace that solar wind every single day. So again, for the weather obsessed in the room, you can look at this website called spaceweather.com, so you can find out what the weather in space is doing, and think about how wonderful the Earth's magnetic field is because it's protecting us from all of this. And so today, the solar wind is streaming towards us at a speed of about 363 kilometers per second. There's a very large sunspot on the side of the sun that's facing us, and that's spitting out a lot of, uh, a lot of plasma, a lot of charged particles in our direction. But the, sun, uh, the Earth's magnetic field is protecting us from that. This website also has loads of information about where the aurora is. Sadly, it's at really, really northern latitudes, so no chance of seeing it uh, in Sussex this evening, I'm afraid. Uh, but any of you who want to know more about space weather, I would encourage you to, to get your daily updates from spaceweather.com. So when this solar wind encounters the obstacle of a magnetized planet, you have a magnetosphere formed. So again, we're starting from the sun. We've got these sunspots on the sun, which are these dark regions of very, very intense magnetic fields. I hope one is about to come into view. Well, there's a couple of them on the surface there. This stream of plasma, which then flows into interplanetary space and then encounters a magnetized planet, here for the case of the Earth. It shapes the, the magnetic field lines of the planet. So on the day side, which is the side facing the sun, they're in this kind of squished dipolar shape. But on the night side, they're able to stretch out into a long magnetic tail. So you get this sort of bullet-shaped magnetosphere. And then most of the solar wind flow is deflected around the planet, but you can have some interaction whereby uh, solar wind particles find their way into the magnetosphere and electric currents are set up that travel along magnetic field lines and that ultimately give us displays like the aurora that we see here on the Earth. So here's just a static sketch of that picture again here for the case of Saturn. So the solar wind is blowing from left to right across the diagram, shown in green, and then the planet is protecting itself with its magnetic field, which is shown in white. And then you get this bullet-like shape with the day side magnetic field lines, essentially in a dipolar type shape. And then the night side magnetic field lines stretched out into a magnetic tail. And then these electric currents can travel along these magnetic field lines and form the aurora. And so we can actually measure the magnetic field in situ. I already said when I talked about Enceladus that Cassini has a magnetic field measuring instrument called a magnetometer on it. And so here, just, just to say that I've shown you some real spacecraft data uh, other than images, here is an illustration of the trajectory that Cassini took when it was on its way in towards Saturn, with Saturn shown here, and then the accompanying magnetic field data shown on the right. And essentially, you can just see the effect of passing from the solar wind into the region that's controlled by the planet's magnetic field, because in the solar wind, the um, magnetic field, this is the total magnetic field, is really, really low. But as you get closer to the planet, the magnetic field increases. Initially, it becomes really turbulent, because when it's flowing from the sun, it's supersonic, and then it encounters this obstacle, and it has to suddenly slow down. But then as you get closer and closer to the planet, which is itself a very strong magnet, the magnetic field strength increases. Now, the aurora, of course, uh, is one of the most beautiful displays of magnetism. Hands up, anyone who's seen the aurora in real life? OK, a fair few. Um, having worked on the aurora for 10 plus years, I saw it for the first time two years ago in Iceland, and it was absolutely incredible. Um, the aurora, of course, here's what it looks like. Um, on the ground, uh, from the ground rather, on the Earth, all different colours, colours related to what's going on in the atmosphere and what type of uh, collisions are happening. But the aurora from space tends to form this kind of an oval shape around the pole. 
So that's what the aurora is like on the Earth. How is it formed? Well, it's formed by these electric currents that travel along these magnetic field lines. So when you have electrons traveling down in towards the polar regions, they collide with particles in the atmosphere and they cause uh, electrons to be excited. And then when the electrons become less excited, they emit light of different colors. And so we can track the magnetic field lines. This is for the case of Jupiter, but it's applicable anywhere. We can trace along these magnetic field lines. We can observe these particles coming in towards the auroral zone. And then we can actually get images of the aurora. So these were some images which were on the cover of Nature magazine back in 2005. It's hard to believe that was already 10 years ago. But these were from Cassini's initial approach to Saturn. And so you can just see from these three images alone how variable the aurora on Saturn tend to be. So sometimes you get this oval shape around the pole, like the example that I showed you for the Earth, but sometimes you get something that looks totally different, that's sort of filled in on one side or more of a spiral shape. And so there's a lot of active research to understand how changes in the solar wind, as shown here, this is the interplanetary magnetic field strength, how that's very variable, how those changes can then squash the magnetosphere and result in changes in the morphology of the aurora. Okay, last but very, not <laughs> very much not least, I've talked about the icy satellites, I've talked about Titan, I've talked about the magnetosphere. I should just say one brief thing about the planet itself and one brief thing about the rings. Uh, the thing that I want to focus on, which might seem a little bit odd, is something that we actually don't know about Saturn, and that is how quickly it rotates. So at the beginning, if you were listening, I said that when the Voyager spacecraft passed by in 1980, it measured the rotation rate of Saturn. Uh, that was actually a lie, but you know, I'm told I have an honest face, so I thought I could maybe get away with it. But it didn't really measure the rotation rate at all. They thought that it did because it measured the pulsing of the radio emission. So the radio emission is emission <laughs> in the radio frequency band that comes from the polar regions of Saturn that is thought to be linked to the magnetic field in the deep interior. Earth has a radio emission, and that can be used to work out the length of a day on the Earth. If you track, for the case of the Earth, it's called the auroral kilometric radiation. If you track the pulsing of that, you will find that it pulses at precisely 24 hours. So for Saturn, Voyager measured this. It measured the pulsing at 10 hours, 39 minutes, and 24 plus or minus 7 seconds. And everybody was happy from 1980 until 2004, well, in terms of the Saturn's rotation rate. And then Cassini arrived, and then it got quite a different number. Actually, there is quite a big difference between 10 hours, 39 minutes, and 10 hours, 45. Saturn is a huge body, and so we know that it's just not physically possible for it to have changed its rotation rate by that much in such a relatively short time without some kind of catastrophic event happening. So that tells us that actually these measurements of the rate of the pulsing of this radio emission are not really telling us the rotation rate of the deep interior. And so we're a little bit stuck on this problem for the moment because we can track surface features, as in we can track the cloud tops of Saturn, but of course, Saturn doesn't have a solid surface, so we can't track in the same way as we could for the Earth. So when we look at storms on Saturn, we can observe how quickly they rotate, but we know that that's not necessarily the same rotation rate as the deep interior of the planet. And just because it's pretty, uh, this is an image which is uh, called the Rose image, which is an image of precisely this, the motion of the cloud tops. This is actually a hurricane that's been raging in the northern polar region of Saturn. Unlike hurricanes on the Earth, it's, which move, it stayed pretty much in the same place. And it's got a sort of a strange hexagonal shape around the pole, and we're trying to figure out what has caused that. But it's great if you want to study storms, but it's no good if you want to learn about the rotation rate of the planet. So that's really a big mystery at the moment. And then my one token slide on the rings. Rings are amazing, um, but you know they're not totally my area of expertise. But I love this story. So this is actually a story where we see the birth of a new moon. And so what I'm showing you here is, I'm giving up on that, is uh, the rings of Saturn. 
And actually, this image was taken because uh, Carl Murray, who was the author of this study, wanted to observe Prometheus, which is this moon here, which is about 100 kilometers across. And so Cassini was taking some images of Prometheus, and then he is very keen-eyed, and he noticed this slight little blip at the edge of the A ring. So Prometheus is orbiting just within the F ring, but there was this slight disturbance close by. And so he zoomed in, and essentially what he found was that as Prometheus was orbiting around within the F ring, it was disturbing the A ring, which was close by. And that's something that we commonly see. It's, it's something known as a shepherding moon. We see them quite a lot because a lot of moons orbit near the rings of Saturn. And as they orbit around, because the moons have sufficient gravity, they can actually drag a little bit of material with them. So as a moon is orbiting within the rings, it might disturb a bit of the material locally, and then it just passes by and the material just goes back to how it was. But occasionally, if the moon creates enough of a disturbance and it manages to disturb enough material, that material can actually clump together and if there's just enough of it, it can form a little moon of its own. And we knew theoretically that this could happen, but this was the first time that that had actually really been observed properly. So what, what he saw was he saw this object being formed at the edge of the rings and then he later on saw the object actually breaking into two. And so what he think happened is that as Prometheus was orbiting around, it dragged a bit of material out of the rings, that material clumped together to form this baby moon. Part of the baby moon got broken off and sucked back in towards Saturn and broken up by Saturn's gravity. And then the other part we think has migrated out away from Saturn and is probably now happily a moon in its own right, but it's just a little bit too small to be directly observed by uh, Cassini's cameras because it's probably less than a kilometer. But this was just a nice story because, as I say, it was the first time that we'd actually observed this process of the birth of a moon. And Carl Murray is uh, the least egotistical scientist you could ever meet. And so he kindly named this new moon Peggy. And he named it after his mother-in-law because he observed this for the first time on her 80th birthday. And that was kind of his gift to her, was to, to call the moon after her. Now, I have a mother-in-law in case this is being recorded. She's a very nice lady, but if I ever make a discovery like this, I think I'll be naming it after myself rather than after her. Uh, but he, he is, he's a better person than I am. Okay, so I just want to finish by showing you a slightly cheesy but kind of cool movie showing some of the future highlights of Cassini, and then I'll just show you one image before I finish. So this is what's coming up. We're now 2015. We're going through to 2017. So these are some of the some of the things to look forward to. Cassini is there in the Saturn system now, has been making discoveries for the last several years, and there's more to come. By studying the satellites in the Saturnian system, we begin to understand something also about the origin of the solar system. There is strong evidence now that most of the surface of Titan is in fact covered with organic material of some kind. We're going to be looking at lakes on the surface of this moon in detail. We're going to be looking at the atmosphere to see how the climate changes over time. We have some global circulation models that tell us as the winds pick up, we think there could be waves on the lakes of liquid methane. Can you imagine anybody thinking that we would discover active cryovolcanism on one of these moons? Geysers? One of the things that we'll do in the next couple of years is make the first ever flyby through the plume when the plume output is at its maximum. And then, of course, there's the planet Saturn itself. As we go through our series of orbits and as the seasons change, it's like having a brand new mission. One Saturn year is nearly 30 Earth years. To be there for nearly half of a Saturn year is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The sun now is coming up on the North Pole, so we're getting to see territory that was in darkness when we first arrived in 2004. Pretty soon we'll have the whole hexagon and the Earth came inside of it, illuminated by the sun. And then of course the mission's end itself is completely unique.
starting in 2016, ending in 2017, these orbits will take us up and over the north and south poles of the planet. We're actually going to dive in between the innermost edge of the D-ring and the upper atmosphere of the planet itself. From that, we're going to learn how is Saturn constructed from inside out. We'll also get the magnetic field of the planet, the mass of the rings for the very first time, and get to sample a place that no spacecraft has ever flown before. This is a mission that cannot be duplicated. So we really want to take advantage of this opportunity to observe seasonal variation in the system. Sorry, that music is, the music is horrific. Sorry about that. Not, not my choice. Um, but yes, that's just sort of some of the highlights of what's coming up for Cassini, and particularly for me, actually, I think the orbits at the end are going to be fantastic because, as they said in, in the video, it's good, we're going to take the spacecraft up over the poles and actually fly just above the top of the atmosphere and inside of the inner edge of the D-ring. So it's just going to be an amazing view out over the ring plane. And then ultimately, the spacecraft will execute a death dive in through Saturn's atmosphere and it will ultimately tumble and we'll lose attitude control. But as we go through, we'll sample some of the upper edges of Saturn's atmosphere for the first time. So that's going to be incredible. And the reason why we do a death dive is, well, firstly, because we want to study the atmosphere because it's interesting, but also for reasons of planetary protection. Because when we find moons like Enceladus or moons like Titan, which have really interesting conditions, potentially habitable conditions, the last thing we want to do is pollute them with an errant spacecraft. So we want to know where the spacecraft ends up. And so I just want to finish by saying that this is a, a rather famous image now, which was taken, it's called the Day the Earth Smiled image. It was taken, I think, two years ago now. Um, it was a project, um, sort of an outreach project in a sense, but it does have some scientific value as well. And it was really a chance when the spacecraft was on the dark side of Saturn to turn the spacecraft back towards the sun. Now, normally that's not allowed because that's a flight rule violation and you essentially break the camera if you point it at the sun. Don't look at the sun when you're looking at the eclipse, I'll say that one more time. Um, but this was a chance to have Saturn backlit by the sun and this absolutely beautiful view of the rings. But it also just gives us a sense of the scale of the solar system. So you probably can't see them on there, but Mars, top left, Venus, middle left, and the Earth and the Moon, and I've just got them zoomed in here. Earth and the Moon less than a pixel across just giving us a sense of the scale of the solar system and you could sort of philosophize about how fragile the earth is and all of that but I'm not going to go there other than just to say that I think images like this really just show us how far we've come in terms of our ability to explore the solar system but also how many more questions that we have to answer and so hopefully uh, with the rest of the Cassini mission and with future missions to the outer solar system we'll find out a lot more and I'll stop there I think. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so old now. I, I've been talking about astronomy for 20 years. I remember um, before the launch of Cassini, we were all looking forward to a successful launch. I remember the seven year journey and looking forward to, to Cassini arriving at Saturn. So it's wonderful to have this. Um, this summary of what we've actually learned over the last 10 years. And it's just amazing that we've got photographs from the surface of Titan and we're yeah. seeing waves on these distant worlds. It's absolutely amazing. So does anyone have any questions? The back there. Hi. Um, Saturn's rings, now that they're known for those small moons and they look again, is it still possible? Yeah, I think that is still the case. So, um, in case anyone didn't hear, essentially, how you know, are the rings still thought to be formed by the break of, of an icy moon? Uh, yes, the composition seems to be consistent that the icy moons are made of similar material as the rings. Um, so, there's an important point within the Saturn system called the Roche limit. It, it, there's a point like that around, around any planet. And that is the point inside of which any material is going to be ripped apart and so and the point outside of which material can clump together and so that's why in Saturn and in other systems you have these rings close to the planet because as soon as material gets close enough to this massive object 
it, the gravity of the massive object, Saturn in this case, is going to rip that material apart. But then anything that's sort of lucky enough to, to migrate outwards and get beyond this, this limit has a chance of surviving intact. So yes, it is thought that the rings and the moons formed around the same time and from similar material. Um, but I also pointed out um, that moon Phoebe as an example of something that doesn't match that. So that's the moon that the oddball that we saw on the way in, which doesn't seem to have a similar composition and which has a retrograde orbit. So when we find objects like that, they are kind of a clue that they were formed either at a different time or they were they were captured. Um, but yeah, that's the current current thinking on the rings. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> yes and no. So, uh, primarily, so Voyager actually measured the composition of the atmosphere, measured some hydrogen and some helium. Uh, there are various theories as to how the outer solar system, uh, well, essentially how Jupiter and Saturn form. So, the main theory about how the solar system formed is that it started from this nebula, this big cloud of gas and dust, and out of that nebula, the four rocky terrestrial planets near the sun formed, and then these outer planets formed. But it's not totally sure whether it was an outside-in or an inside-out process. So whether you had a, a rocky core that sort of accreted or gathered a load of gas onto itself, or whether you had just a load of gas and whether it's gas all the way through. It is uh, difficult to probe that, and you need to have many, many, many orbits quite close to the body to try and resolve that. And so questions like that are actually best answered in the latter part of the mission because that's when we're going to go much, much, much closer than we've been before. Um, and the, as you say, the closer you get, the easier it is to, to look at the composition. But certainly we know that hydrogen and helium are the primary elements given the lightness of the planet. So Saturn is actually less dense than water. So if you were to find a bath big enough, it would float. Um, Although, why would you ever have a bath big enough? That is such a silly statistic. But anyway, um, a very long-winded answer, but potentially some kind of a, a rocky or a liquid metal core, but we're still, we're still working towards fully figuring out how it's chemically differentiated inside. I think this gentleman might have one. In, uh, yeah, because you had your hand and then I'll come back to you next. Um, okay, so how dangerous is the radiation? Uh, not as dangerous as at Jupiter. Jupiter's radiation belts will fry you really, really quickly. Um, yes, for human exploration of Titan, I think there are, radiation might be, might be a fairly major challenge because Saturn has such a strong magnetic field that it has a lot of trapped electrons, a lot of um, trapped plasma, and so one thing that we do when we're flying a, an unmanned spacecraft is that we have some radiation hardening of the components so that they can resist that. Um, but I wouldn't say that Titan is a particularly human-friendly place. Um, Pardon? It's only cold. There's nothing. Uh, what's the other problem? Is that? Well, so it's it's a, well, it's radiation getting there in the first place. I mean, even actually from a human exploration perspective for the solar system full stop getting even to mars is a, is a radiation challenge so when the curiosity spacecraft flew to mars it actually measured the radiation between earth and mars and it was significantly higher than they thought that it was going to be and so <clears throat> when you're having humans in a spacecraft for a long period of time when you're outside of the earth's atmosphere you're outside of the protection of the earth's magnetic field you're exposed to a lot of cosmic rays, you're exposed to a lot of radiation, and that is just terminal for humans. And really the only way to protect against that is through a lot of lead shielding around your spacecraft, which is super heavy and super expensive and makes launch sort of... Well, it's kind of practically quite difficult to shield in that, in that way. It's September 2017. Sorry? September 
So initially, um, the initial plan was for a four-year mission. It got there in 2004. The nominal mission was four years. Then there was an extension to the Equinox mission, which took us um, through Equinox, which was 2009 to 2010. And then now we're in the Solstice mission, which takes us to 2017. The spacecraft is still pretty healthy. It's not a fuel issue. In general, with missions ending, it's a funding issue. And it's that, you know, there's a limited amount of funding and they can't supposedly pay for everything. So, pretty much. Now, sadly. Yes, yeah. Oh gosh, <laughs> good question. I really should know that number off the top of my head. I know typically when it's within the magnetosphere, it's going about 10 kilometers a second. Um, speed on the way there, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry, <laughs> I'll have to check that one. Yeah, 5 billion kilometers in seven years. Yeah, has anyone got yeah, a calculator on their phone <laughs> quickly? <laughs> save me, save me. <laughs> Uh, I think yeah. he, you haven't asked yeah, one yet. Yeah, we've got time so for just um, one more question, I think. So. I'm just going to ask, um, yeah. how long are the rings expected to last around Saturn? Are they expected to go away in the future? Uh, good question. And uh, <laughs> this is honestly not a cop-out, but again, a question that is going to be best answered by these proximal orbits. So in that film that I showed at the end, they talk about measuring the mass of the rings. And the mass of the rings is also linked to their age. And it's been a little bit difficult to age the rings. We know that they're dynamic. We know that moons are forming and breaking apart. Um, and so we've had one pass through the rings on the way in. So when Cassini arrived, it used the high gain antenna as a kind of a shield and it went up right through the ring plane. But since then we've stayed fairly well clear of the rings. And so really the last sort of six months to year of the mission is the prime time to get really close up and to look in more detail at the composition and to age the rings. And so that number isn't precisely known, but that will be one of the key aims of the final year of the mission. Okay, there'll be um, time for more questions over um, tea and coffee. Um, I'd just like to thank Katrina once again for coming in. I know you're incredibly busy, not one, but two PhD students, oh, supervisors, and yeah. a postdoc <laughs> to work with. So thank you very much, um, Katrina. Thank you. Thank you.